you have given a lot of examples of brain-machine interfaces. Uh, what is your vision? What problems can be solved in the next 10 years? Sure. Uh, so the first step is really think about brain-machine interface as a way to address some neurolog neurological diseases, right? There's a lot of people suffering from problems with the brain, right? So think about just very simple, somebody has basically an accident, you get in a car, spinal cord broken, paraplegic, right? So you're sitting there, you, your brain is perfectly intact, but you cannot send control signals anymore to the rest of your body. If you can bridge that gap, if you can start sending signals back to your limbs and make people move again, that's a big step. Other examples, epilepsy, uh, ELS, a very, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease as it's called, people who are perfectly fine in their brain, neural ends die off, suddenly you're stuck in your mind. Um, perfect example, Steve Hawkins is thinking, he's amazing, he has been managing to maintain communication. But imagine what it is to lose that. If you can restore that, that's huge. So there's a lot of opportunities in the foreseeable future. And that's really where brain-machine interface is going to shine in the beginning, is restore functionality. But then, at some point in time, when you say, well, if I indeed have that bandwidth, I have that link with the brain, what else can you do? Is it indeed an opportunity for us to interact with information much more effectively than we do today? So that's the next step, but that's much further out. So this sounds just awesome, but what are the concerns? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously people are very scared about their brain. Somebody sneaking into their brain, listening to your thoughts, all those type of things are obvious concerns, right? That you've heard all about uh, the security issues these days with the NSA. Think what it might mean if somebody sneaks into your head. So um, we definitely have to think about it. Now, one advantage is that it's not easy to read those signals. You have to be very close by. So basically tapping into it is not going to be a very trivial thing. But we have to basically, as scientists, we have to be aware of those concerns right now. The second step comes when you don't only listen, but when you can start doing activation, stimulation. Then it becomes even a more scary thing. However, at the same time, we're already doing this. There's a lot of people walking around today with deep brain stimulation. People with Parkinson that today can walk again right where otherwise, if you turn it off, they basically would be totally non-functional. So, there's, as I said before, every technology has the good parts, and there's always a bad part. And it's our scientists and the society that have to think about how to address this type of things, up front. So will it be a wonderful or a scary future? I think it will be wonderful, absolutely. I'm totally excited about it. It's really something that's going to revolutionize how we as humans interact with each other. So finally, how do you define innovation? Well, innovation for me is something to be willing to take a step beyond, a, a quantum step that goes way beyond. So at a certain point you say, now imagine what would happen if I can do this. It might seem impossible, but then you say, okay, let's try to break it down. Is it really impossible? What are the type of things? What are the impediments? That's really where innovation comes from. Something that basically is a new paradigm and might change things substantially. And there's so many examples that were talked about today. For instance, this connected world. The fact that we're going to be surrounded and living with trillions of devices around it. They all talk to each other. That's going to change things. This is going to change the way we live our life, how we interact, how we do things, and so on and so forth. That's another example of innovation. And there's so many other ones.